and nobody else, to my knowledge, has been able to draw the line you're asking me to draw here off the cuff tonight. Uh, that's why I chose this evening to talk about what I was pretty comfortable with, which is self-chosen hastening of dying in conditions of terminal disease and illness. That's the only way, I, I'm not a bioethicist, and, uh, but I think that in the conditions that I, that the way that I described it, that which I am perfectly willing to defend, that I feel pretty good about that. Should I ask you my question? Okay. Sure. okay. This is a question that because I knew Dr. Warnell was a uh, minister, that I thought, and I've been actually asking this question of people, but I'd like to know from, and this is a theological, question, I think. And I am completely not a theologian, in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> uh, some to whom I have addressed this question have told me uh, the following. Uh, I want to know, what is the benefit of allowing someone we love to suffer unto death when death is imminent and unavoidable? And some people I've asked this question have told me of their belief that to suffer pain and agony unto death is an opportunity to become more Christ-like, to share in the suffering Jesus experienced on the cross. And I do understand the idea of being tested, which is not uncommon to most religions. However, I do not understand the idea of becoming more Christ-like. Um, I grew up hearing that, uh, that Jesus suffered so that anyone who commits to Jesus are forgiven for their sins. And if this is so, and Jesus was chosen by God to suffer for this reason and in this way, then there does not seem to be a reason for his followers to suffer unto death. And how can we become more Christ-like since the very reason for the suffering has been completed by Jesus? Excellent question. Um, my answer for that would go, and I, I'm going you know, to put the story of Job for to answer that question. Uh, there was there was one thing lacking in Job in that story. Uh, in my understanding of Christianity, there's nothing in it that glorifies or exalts suffering. Mm -hmm. To glorify and exalt suffering would be to uh, take structures of sin and then magnify and exalt structures of sin, be it the medical industrial complex, which sometimes causes the, the suffering, or that which is beyond. So be very clear, I am not exalting suffering. What I'm saying is that that in a life of, for instance, Job, he didn't understand what his suffering for, but his suffering brought him to a change of mind where, and it would even be for what even Christ would have died for. Christ died for sin. There's also supposedly in the Christian belief, and I hold to it, that there's a change in the fusus, a change in the nature of a human being, and that change undergoes testing. So that the human being then can express to others love and kindness and being there for the other. In the situation of Mary Bartwick, that was my mother. Um, there was an unresolved situation there where she indeed had reconciliation and her suffering brought her to a point where there was, even in her dementia, there was places in, 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 in these spots of awareness where she realized this was an opportunity and perhaps my last. She suffered up to a point which allowed her to let go of saying, no, I'm going to hold on to this physical life for whatever, to I'm going to hold on to this physical life until this child of mine comes and there's resolution and then I let go. So um, we would call it in the Christian contours, um, severe mercy of sanctification. The setting aside of our lives in order to be purified. It seems ridiculous for some of you, um, but I would suggest that there's something that goes on within that allows us to bear the suffering as an example to those who are outside. That's the best answer I can give to you on that. Um, I have a question on the issue of choice and self-determination. Um, David Warren's lecture was by far no, by no means a Christian, said that patient autonomy, self-determination, those things are illusions and he said, and when he said that, he said that because actually it, it's the physician value system that is really, truly determining uh, how long the patient will suffer, when the patient will die. Um, just uh, last October, um, an excellent uh, presentation by uh, Holtzgang scholar, uh, Dr. Barbara Koenig, 
said the same thing, that patient autonomy is an illusion. Um, she laid out a few things. I'll just basically lay out why I'm concerned that there's such a thing as patient autonomy, because they persuaded me to question that. Um, there seems to be five actors, and I'll lay these out, in five actors in the decision-making complex of a, of a patient. First, you have the patient's input. A second actor is that of the physician. A third actor is um, the close relationships, family, surrogates, or whatever. And the fourth is the medical complex that they're in, their policies and procedures, etc. And then the final is the, the uh, governing systems around them. It, it seems to me that there, that, and if you move even one step beyond, there's even the spiritual dimension, but if even I just go to the five, um, they all seem to direct the, the individual to a place where there's not much of a choice that's really going on. It almost looks like a Hobson's choice. There is only one choice, and that I must choose. And so that, that's what I guess my, my question is, with that complex, is there really truly a patient self-determination? Oh, if there isn't, we should get rid of advanced directives. And I think you forgot insurance companies. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be number six. Uh, I, I think that uh, I have uh, patient autonomy uh, according to when I choose the physicians that I choose. And I'm very careful about who I choose as physicians. I think I have freedom to fill out the advanced directives this is the way I see fit. I have the freedom to talk to my two sons who would be the medical uh, power of attorney people for me, that type of thing. So I don't certainly control hospitals and I don't control the medical schools who produce doctors or any of that, but there's a certainly a degree of, uh, I believe that I have a certain degree of control, particularly and most importantly when I choose a physician. The, um, the advanced directives are they are honored, depending upon the state of Oregon, is the best about 37% of the time, 11% some of the southern areas. So advanced directives are, at least from my understanding, depends upon the interpretation of the physician. But here's another, this is, a, this is something that bothers me, and you can help me on this one, I hope. Uh, and this comes from uh, Herbert Marcus. He had a concern that if we educated, if we socially engineered individuals in the area of choosing to be able to die, that we would lose the ability even to come to a type of utopia. Now, now he's not a Christian, but by any means, Marcus is, as Marxist leanings. And my question is, what, what, what form exists in academia today, in a university today, that would permit, other than Socratic up here, that would permit sufficient teaching so that individuals would not be necessarily socially engineered to one point or another, but to where you would have true liberal thinking, to where there would be sufficient data and pathos to where choice could be made. Uh, I'll say any philosophy class. <laughs> I mean, that's where we teach critical thinking skills. Yeah. That, that, was just a, that was a question of mine, you know, because you know, there, there seems to be, there seems to be, and, and it, obviously because we're here, maybe it's not here, but for instance, there seems to be a lack of, in some institutions, an expression of a Judeo-Christian, permission of a Judeo-Christian opinion without it being through food, as this is absolute nonsense. And in a sense, if, if you look at any kind of transcendental notions, it is nonsense, it's beyond sense. But Beyond, what I'm wondering is that, do you see that? Do you see a, a diminution of the ability of a Judeo-Christian ethic permitted to be expressed? Um, and not just in the contours here, because I don't, I'm, obviously we have this discussion in the New York but beyond here. Beyond here, you mean in the United States? Or um, where? What's how far uh, beyond? Let's just, let just say in the contours of academia in the United States. Uh, I, I think actually, for example, in philosophy, most of the philosophers from the uh, 17th century forward are Christian philosophers. And uh, so there's a lot of Christian content in ethics, for example. And, uh, and then before, you know, there, of course, Aristotle's pre, 
pre-Judeo, pre, pre-Christian, but not pre-Judaism, I guess. But at any rate, yes, and one of the things I'm personally most proud of is uh, students from the whole breadth of religious persuasions and ethics class end up feeling in my classes affirmed, and I'm really very proud of that. But uh, I think that we have far less opportunity to include um, uh, ethics and uh, questions and concerns from Islam, from Buddha, in our, our department. We have a Buddhist scholar and now a Hindu scholar and a Christian scholar. So we're in pretty good shape that way in our, in our program. So um, I don't see, I myself am not disrespectful of any person's religion. Uh, that I, I mean, I have no problem with any person's religion. So I, I, I don't know what else to say. Well, uh, that was just a that was just a question and curiosity on my part. Do um, you want to open this, Dr. Robert? Are we ready to go to the outside? Sure, I'm ready to go to the audience. Okay. I mean, okay. <coughs> well, we'll now open up the discussion to the audience. Uh, we ask that you write down your questions ahead of time. Please ask no more than one question, and clearly and swiftly. Offer no statements. Uh, please raise your hand and I will call on you. I will try to be as equitable as possible. Some of you will not be called upon. Uh, that's just the nature of how many questions we're going to have. <coughs> Once you have successfully a a asked your question, please um, do not offer any comments or rebuttals. Uh, and let me emphasize that the question should be respectful and to the point. So, gentlemen right there. Yeah. The questions down, uh, I will try to do that, but I haven't written it down yet. I, I do have the question of, uh, he brought up the fact that he, he doesn't believe in those authorities, uh, because of your experience of, of state authorities, to uh, make decisions on these, uh, in, in these areas. Well, we you talked about not being autonomous. Well, of course, we're in a, we're in a, a context of, of, of authorities. I myself hold to the position uh, and I guess you would say that this not that I am, uh, I have that choice. Whose life is it anyway? It's ultimately my choice. And no authority has a right to override my choice. Sir, do you have a question? Oh, no authority. Yeah, well, the question is, uh, <laughs> do you, does he, does he, it, it seems to be that he said no authority uh, with his state, but yet what do those authorities be? If he had authority. Uh, what I was saying is that I don't trust in investing in the hands of governing bodies the ability to terminate a uh, human life for medical reasons. That's, that's what I'm saying. I, I, think I, I have a, a mistrust because of history to empower them to do that. That, that is, that's what I'm saying. Mr. Roberts, would you like to respond? No, he wasn't asking. No, I, I, I have. If you want, you have a chance. Okay, but I was asking him. Yeah. No. I, okay. Next question. Yes, sir. The ability to make a uh, right choice is dependent on society or education or anything like that. How can a person be held morally responsible for anything? To whom is the question addressed? Oh, well, uh, on the right. <laughs> it's difficult for someone dyslexic like me to figure out which way is right. So, okay. So let me restate your question and make sure that I have um, understand you correctly. If you are saying that if we are, for instance, we are bordered by the physician, his value system, the hospital's value system. Um, the surrogates and also the state, what what choice do I have anyway? Is that what you're saying? Well, you were questioning whether we have the education in universities to allow a person to make a choice for themselves. Yeah, to be autonomous. And say, in that case, then, uh, if it depends on that kind of thing, what moral responsibility does anybody have for the decision about anything in Right. All right, that's, a, that's an outstanding question, and so I'll address that and I'll pass the mic over. Um, what I'm questioning is the ability of, of what is framed as the principle of autonomy, and that 
a patient's autonomy can override.